G'day, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Christie David. I run a mortgage broking business called Atelier Wealth, but that's not why we're here. What we do on each and every episode is we bring in someone that has a very unique skill set when it comes to property investing, whether that's they've been there, done that, whether they're heavily involved in the industry, or whether they've got an area of speciality. And today's guest, I'm very, very excited to bring on because he's someone that has years of experience. I'm talking years of uh, insider knowledge into the industry, someone that's at the top of their game when it comes to the property investing uh, management side of the industry as well, and someone that's also putting out books, which I think is fantastic in terms of sharing knowledge and expertise as well. Really excited. Nicola McDougal, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's really good to be here. I appreciate you jumping on early morning from, uh, I'm going to say, bright and sunny Queensland. How are you doing up there? Lovely. It's been so hot, though. It is crazy. Yesterday, it said it was 34 degrees, but actually it felt like 38. And I tell you what, it really did. Yeah. I mean, you're up Sunshine Coast way, right? So when you when it's hot, you feel it. I mean, it's almost like you're in tropical Asia uh, sometimes, isn't it, that humidity? And, and being originally from New Zealand, even though I've been gone for 30 years next year, yeah. um, you know, it's December, January, not my most favorite parts of the times of the year. I've always struggled, you know. I like winter yes. in Queensland, uh, but, you having know, during this winter. time of year, I find it extraordinarily hot. Yeah, but having said that, your winter's still like mid-20s and balmy. I was up there in the Sunshine Coast last year for winter. I'm like, don't you get used to this? It's Honestly, like you have, you know, a pair of jeans <laughs> or like I've got like brown flared cords and they last you about five years yeah, because you, you literally wear them for like a couple of months of the year and then you put, pop them away in your winter wardrobe for like, you know, next August or something. When you're living your life in boardies and shorts and, and T-shirts, mate, you know, you've made a right move to uh, a beautiful part <laughs> of the world. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us. And I, when I had a look at, I guess, your profile and obviously you do a uh, contribution to the industry, I mean, your, your background has been involved in the Australian Property Investment Magazine, which I think gives you a unique insight into the into this industry and space. You've also, you run Bricks and Mortar, which is your, your core business uh, and that involvement in the property investment space. Chair of PIPA, which I think is super exciting, which we want to have a chat to you about as well, and then putting out books. So uh, I won't say, business is not the word, I'm going to say productive and efficient is probably the word for you. So um, using the word productive, it almost leads me to my three Ps. So a bit about yourself personally, professionally, and your own property journey, if you want to share with us a little bit about yourself, Nicola. Well, personally, if we're, if we're thinking about the property space, you know, um, I started out as a general news journalist and um, many, many, many years ago, um, and um, but always had a property background, like I'm from, uh, originally from New Zealand. Um, my grandfather was uh, in the, uh, did some commercial property developments back a very, 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 very long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, my father, uh, my, my grandfather was a, a business owner. Um, then my father was in property investment, also a business owner. Right. Um, and then here I am, you know, many moons later uh, yeah. in property investment and a business owner as well. Um, so I often say sort of learning at the kitchen table um, okay. was, you know, my, my, my background in regards to um, entrepreneurship, I suppose, you know. Um, also, you know, I, so I started as a general news journalist. I actually used to be a political journalist for a while and followed John Howard around um, the awesome. hustings many, many years ago. Um, and then kind of just sort of transitioned at the time. I thought it was a little random uh, into property reporting and things. And I, um, so how long ago were we talking about? 17 years ago. Okay, well, um, giving away anyone's age here. You walked straight. Yeah, yeah. 17 years ago, there. I'd been traveling overseas and um, I came back to Australia and, um, a seven-month maternity leave contract came up uh, for the REOQ as the oh, nice. communications coordinator. And at the time, I was a print journalist, a daily newspaper journalist, and I went, oh, look, you know, I want to do something different. I kind of had the pip with, with journalism a little bit at the time. Seemingly, I thought back in those days it was changing too rapidly. No idea <laughs> how much it was going to change. <laughs> and um, and so I applied for that job and ended up uh, being at the REOQ for seven and a half years. And from a seven-month maternity leave contract, ended up being the executive director of corporate affairs uh, by the time that I left. And I only left because I got offered the role as the editor of Australian Property Investor magazine um and i was there for a few years and then um, my mother was very unwell with alzheimer's and i decided to take some time out 
to help care for her. She's since passed on. Um, and that was seven years ago. And I thought, well, I'm just going to leave. I'm going to go do some, I'm going to go do some freelance. <laughs> and then within two years, I was so super busy um, that my dear friend, Kieran Clare, who had been um, a journalist at Australian Property Investor Magazine, um, and since at, at that point, API had folded and mm. he was working at the Korean Mail and he was doing a little bit of freelance on the side for me. And I um, took him out for a long lunch and said, dude, we should really go into business together. And that's where Bricks and Mortar Media uh, was born. And it's our sixth year this year Fantastic. Um, and going from strength to strength, you know, super busy and stuff. So um, I could go, I guess I'm sort of answering a few questions. I'm answering the yeah. personal and professional there, but that's. That's kind of the, the the journey in regards to how I've ended up focusing on property, and it's and Kieran and I, it's a wonderful um, business marriage. Um, in that I was a journalist who became a specialist in property. He was a former valuer oh, uh, for twenty years, and he became a journalist. So we kind of uh, cro- cro- crossed over in regards in regards to that. Um, I got involved with Pippa um, in. Geez, 2014, I think Ben Kingsley tapped me on the shoulder at a property investment conference and said, you should join, you should apply to join the board. And so I did. Um, and we're all volunteers um, at, at the board level of PIPA. Um, and then thankfully, you know, I was there for um, obviously eight years. And then a year ago I was elected um, a ch- the chair. So um, that's amazing. Very busy. Yeah, um, nice. and, and, and also last year, the female investor came out, which uh, I wrote with another good friend of mine, Kate Hill down in Sydney. Um, and that's gone very, very well, uh, was named the, uh, 2022 personal finance and investment business book of the year in November. Cool. Um, and then today, today, uh, property investing for dummies, third Australia d- edition is actually available for sale. So, you know, I've been a little busy. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So that's does that answer to, does that answer your question, or maybe yeah. I answered many yeah. questions in one yeah. monologue. Yeah. Thank you very much. And as a journal, <laughs> it just rolls off the tongue for you. So thank you very much. Um, I do. Before we kick off, I just want to share one thing, which is our chat is going to be general in nature and not intended to give advice. So if you do need advice, please seek out a professional. Uh, but you just just glazed over that, which is you have a book dropping today, which is the third edition of Property Investing for Dummies, which I think is fantastic. So congratulations. And yeah. uh, we're going to get a, call, a hold of a couple of books and, and share that with a few listeners. But take me through. So we're at the third edition, and I'm sure between the second edition and now there have been plenty of changes that have gone on. And I'm going to say most would require an edit. I'm going to say that almost required rewriting your book. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when yeah, when Wiley so Wiley's my publisher, and um, they asked me, "Geez, was it about? I don't know when it was. It might have been May last year, maybe." A female investor had just come out, and they asked me if I was interested in what well, was their first choice to write the third edition, Excellent. and I was like, obviously, you know, super grateful and great, awesome, yeah. yeah. Um, said yeah, and then I went, oh, "I better read it." Um, and, uh, anyway, so I didn't realize that the previous edition was 10, nearly 10 years old. Yeah. Um, but look, yeah, it was a significant, um, there was a significant rewriting. There was significant editing. There was significant portions that just went, oh my God, that's not even a thing anymore. That needs to come out. Uh, but yeah, so many changes, you know, some of the key ones in there, um, when it was first written, it was in the tail end of. I guess the lingering effects from the GFC. Yeah. (laughs) So there was a lot of references to the GFC, for example. Um, Clearly, property prices significantly different. Like we're talking about, this book was written before the property boom in Sydney. um, You know, in the 2010s period, Um, there was uh, talking about those uh, glorious things that used to exist of 105 percent mortgages. Um, so, it, you know, and it was very, there was a lot at that at the time. And I remember this because obviously I've, I've been in the industry that long. I sometimes call myself a real estate barnacle. Um, but um, they uh, were talking a lot about self-managed super fund investing because that was the new black at the time. Um, so when while that's still a thing and it's suitable for some people if they've got professional advice on it, yeah. um, it was 
there was a lot of references to it and you could, you know, cause it was such a bit, a new thing at that point. Mm. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of work involved to bring it up to date and to, you know, and you know what, it was quite, it was almost like a walk down memory lane where when I was doing it, because I was, there was a lot of things in there that I'd forgotten were a thing mm. or geez, you know, how, how, you know, how much the sector has evolved yeah, certainly my sector in, reg- in in regards to Pippa, which Pippa was in existence then, but very grassroots. Yeah. Um, you know, just about the rise of buyers agents, for example, and all these types of things. It was, it, yeah, it, it, it was like you know, as someone who was sat there and 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 it and wrote it and looked at everything that happened ten years ago. It's just go. It just went to show how fluid and how ever changing the sector is you know and it was there and in, in literally in black and white yeah. um so yes yeah, so that's out today which is super exciting um there is actually two smaller guides that are going to um are going to be released later this year too so technically last year um i had well this year i'll have four books on the shelves unreal congratulations <laughs> And we'll have a chat in a second about the other books, but I I want to go, uh, you've uh, touched on Pippa and your involvement mm. in Pippa. So property investing has evolved. Yes. And as evolution happens, new entrants come into the market, therefore we need to have a bit more regulation or a bit more of a compliance, for example. Uh, and I look at I look at buyers agents who probably were broking was, you know, go back maybe 10 years and low barriers to entry. Didn't really have the structure or the framework, for example, around managing, you know, good, great, and then sometimes the bad that come in as well and putting in some plans to manage that. So take me through with your role that's gone from the board. So being a member to becoming part of the board to now becoming chair, for example, what's Pippa's role? How does mm. it protect a property investor? And then what's your big focus being at the helm of Pippa as well? Yeah, because um, um, Pippa is about 15 years um, old now and originally and still uh, was established because of the low barriers to entry, you know, in regards to property investment advice. Um, unfortunately, that is still the case, yeah. um, generally speaking. Um, we were established to lobby um, governments uh, for regulation in the space. Um, sometimes over the years, it seemed like that we were pretty close to being successful. <laughs> Yeah. haven't been yeah. um you know and you know when you work in a, and I've worked in you know um industry associations for a number of years now um you know and the, one of the hardest parts is you sort of make these connections and things like that and and then next thing the government changes and you're back to square one and it depends on whether they have any appetite for change um in regards to property not classed as a financial instrument and I, and unfortunately you know are we ever going to be successful about creating, you know, helping to create regulation in that space. I would like to think so, um, but so far, nada. You know, we ha- we haven't been. So at a board level, um, and obviously pippa has gone from strength to strength, you know, uh, compared to where we were all those years ago, we are a, a, a significant organisation um, that has a significant profile. Yes. Um, we can affect change, you know, obviously probably I'm, you know, I made a joke last year because when the Queensland land tax came in um, and we knew that it was, we obviously knew that it was proposed and when it was first proposed end of 2021, I was like, oh man, that's never going to get through. Like it was just so ridiculous. And I was away in New Zealand actually visiting my dad for the first time since COVID and I got all, my phone just went mental in June last year. Um, of all these people going, oh, my God, they've passed it. And I'm like going, oh, what? Mm. Um, So, you know, um, our dear friends at the REOQ, various other industry associations, um, you know, we had been lobbying for a long time. um, And thankfully, every year we have the annual investor sentiment survey. Yeah. And last year was our eighth annual survey. And it always comes out in August. And so we decided, and every year we ask specific there's a bunch of questions that are the same every year, but then there's a bunch of questions that are specific to what's happening at the moment. Yep. So we asked investors, you know, what they'd, if they'd sold, where they'd sold, why they sold, uh, if they were thinking of selling, you know, what were the reasons? And um, I was the first person to see the results of that. Yeah. And I remember sitting at my dining table going, holy moly, because it showed that 45% of investors had sold at least one property in Queensland in the previous two years. Mm. 
and a huge uh, a huge co uh, around the nation. A lot of investors had sold, and they had sold in the last two years because of rising prices. We get that, yeah. um, but the intention for for investors selling in the year ahead was yeah. that they were going to be selling more. And clearly, as we know, we're in the middle of you know a generational rental crisis. Yeah. Um, so. That was the first time I think that anyone had actually kind of asked investors, you know, what are you doing and why are you doing that? So um, we worked very hard behind the scenes to get that um, data ratified from an independent source, um, then did a, a, a significant media campaign around it. Um, and uh, seven days later, the legislation was shelved. Um, so that for me, so for me, that was like, I couldn't believe it, man. Like I couldn't believe it. And I sort of joked to a few people at the time, that's it. I can, I can retire. I can resign from the board now. La la la. So unfortunately though, um, you know, those pressures on investors and that we're talking about August, you know, last year, yeah. um, those pressures on investors are just ever increasing. Um, so for me as the chair um, actually, I was talking to a board member yesterday and he goes, well, how long do you reckon you'll be the chair? And I said, I've probably got a couple more years in me, but who knows? Um, uh, I would like, my goal is to try to help to change the narrative around, in, the prevailing narrative around investors in this country. Okay. Um, I despise the fact, the whole greedy landlord or landlady um, narrative. I despise um, how poorly, you know, we're treated in political circles. I despise um, the fact that, you know, there's this thing about investors that we all own six properties or 20 properties and we all know that the stats don't lie and it's, mm. you know, what, 71% of investors own one. Correct. You know, and well, in, in total, 90%, so 71% own one. And if you push it up to 90%, own two. Right. And that's the reality. But I re so for me, I guess if I was thinking about a goal, I would like to affect change in that narrative. Um, I would like governments, this is my lofty goal, to incentivize investors because at the moment, obviously, investor lending is falling uh, because generally they can't secure finance. Um, and we are in a terrible, you know, the rental market is in a terrible mess mm. uh, for a bunch of reasons, predominantly because investors haven't been transacting at their average level for many years. Yep. And a lot of them have deserted the market. So how 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 is that going to change? Well, we need to encourage investors back into the market. Um, so if I could in some way create that, then that would be, you know, maybe I would I would retire, not retire from work, but resign from the board. At that point, if we could just, you know, have some type of incentive and change the narrative around the vital role that investors have in our society, yeah, you know, and in and in supplying the vast majority of rental properties in this country. Oh, well said, well said. I think one thing that we often advocate for is being a good uh, investor. Yes, being a good land. Lady, person. landlord. Yep, <laughs> land person. Which is if your tenant needs something, see to it. I think it's an it's it's a it's a it's a privilege, not a right. And I think we've got to do the right thing as an investor community. Go if the dishwasher's broken, if something's happening at the house, just fix it. Get on with life. We've all rented at one point in our lives and and had a good landlord versus a bad one. And you go, just err on err on the good side and pay it forward potentially to to a to a renter because you never know what they're going through as well given that exactly one can't exist without the other right it's a symbiotic re relationship okay. and and um and i also in regards to the narrative you know it really irks me when i see these media stories <laughs> where they are just talking about the bad you know the, the bad property investors and not the vast majority who are doing the right thing yeah. and especially when we think about those statistics that, you know, the vast majority own one or two properties mm. just so that they can have a better financial life and not rely on the pension in retirement. Mm. And seemingly in this country, that's a bad thing that you're not going to be relying on the public purse in retirement. Oh, <clears throat> I think that's fantastic, you it know, but no one said it seems to, but yeah, we, and I always advocate for that. Yeah. Um, and and certainly, you know, with the books, the, certainly with the female investor, it's it's about being, you know, the the best property investor that you can be, yeah. including being fair and reasonable to your tenants. Yeah, well said, well said. Just one thing before we move on to the female investor uh, book that you've put out, uh, QPIA. I went, I, mm. I went through. I think was one of my COVID projects, for example, to finish my qualifications, and Very good. having gone through that, um, that's a rigorous program in terms of 
the detail that you go through. So if you don't understand qualified property investment advisor is the uh, is the outcome. So I am qualified to give property investment advice. Uh, and then I feel like that was a really good benchmark. It was quite a detailed course, for example. So take me through how does an investor then find someone who's QPA mm. uh, qualified in, in that Regarding. Yeah, so the QPIA obviously was developed um, years ago um, because of the low barriers to entry and the fact that there um, is not a lot of training for anyone who available and even under the law, you know, if you want to work as a, an, a property investment advisor, you know, you can pretty much put your sign up outside and go, you know, show okay. me the money, yeah. you know. Um, so we, you know, we developed the QPIA um, and we just updated it last year um, so that people who wanted to make sure that they were giving, you know, proper property investment advice yeah. um, knew what they were talking about. Because, look, let's be honest, there's a number of industries, and we're not just talking about buyers, agent, mortgage broking in your space, accounting, Bunch even conveyancing, yeah. where just organically, because of the clients that you have sitting across from you, you end up you know, the client might ask you things about property investment and we knew that people were giving their opinion, but it wasn't advice because they didn't necessarily know what they were talking about. So we're like, we we were always always like, well, if that's happening, let's train them. Let's create this program so that when they are asked those questions, they actually know what they're talking about. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Um, So that's, you know, and the QPIA is going from strength to strength. We've got, um, that was, let me think. Uh, might be about 800 people that have, you know, gone through the program now, um, which is significant. And, and uh, you know, with PIPA and the QPIA, because of the lack of regulation in the space, we're talking about people like you uh, and many people like you who are the good guys and girls of the industry who are voluntarily deciding mm-hmm. to, you know, lift their game, become a member of the association, which which is not a tick and flick approach and it requires, you know, higher standards of business practice, various disclosures, things like that. And also who are actually volunteering to do additional training right. so that they can actually make sure that the advice that they're giving is sound and valid. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we always say preferably work with a PIPA member and preferably work with someone um, that is QPIA. Um, yeah. Obviously they would have um, the branding associated with that, but certainly on the on the PIPA website, people can search for PIPA members and, and QPIAs as well. And my goal um, apart from the incentivization of investors, is that every single person who is looking, you know, always have these lofty goals, every single person who's looking for property investment advice in this country, um, if they sit down with someone, they ask them, are you a PIPA member? Are you a QPIA? And if they're not, they walk away. Like, how great would that be? And then we have true self-regulation All right. because at the moment there is no regulation. So if we have to be that body that is, you know, regulating the the sector, um, then that would be an extraordinary outcome and just wonderful consumer protection as well. Isn't it? Yeah, well said. I mentioned I said that we get have a uh, chat about your book, which you put out, which is the female investor. And I'm a little bit intrigued because female invest investor numbers are on the up, uh, and it's interesting when you look at who are the female investor participation rates. So younger investors that are coming into the market but also uh, older investors, and we're talking maybe females that are aged over 55. And it's a, it's an interesting one because it, I feel like it's a life cycle reflection. So younger, I look at younger females, highly qualified, for example, good incomes that are coming in, probably seeing their parents and what's happened to their situation, trying to learn and try and take control back on their financial independence. Then you probably go into that, that middle stage in life, which is maybe family, children, or career. And then you come later in life, which is, that moment where you go, I need to plan for retirement mm-hmm. and what's the way to get there? Because if you look at probably females that are over 55, they probably don't have the super balances to to get them to retirement comfortably as well. So take me through, you've probably done a lot of research uh, in this space as well. So take me through what your research has entailed, where the book is hitting a spot and what some of those insights have been as well, please, Nicola. Yeah, I actually um, wrote the outline for the book in 2018 and, and pitched it to Wiley and they were keen and then I sort of abandoned it. I, I think it was the same time as we were sitting up Bricks and Water Media. Yeah. And I mentioned it to Kate a couple of years ago, Kate Hill, my co-author and a good friend of mine, and uh, she's a QPIA in Sydney. And um, she said, oh, love, you really need to do this book. And I said, oh, man, I'm so busy, you know, blah, blah, blah. And she said, well, shall we do it together? And I went, that is a great idea, you know, because we truly, both of us, truly believe um, in helping to inspire women 
to create some financial independence and to improve their financial outcomes throughout during their lives, but also in retirement. Yeah, nice. um, so we, I reworked the proposal, pitched it into Wiley, and they like we like jumped all over it, and we actually had the book done in about four months. Nice one, which is crazy. Nice. So it went from yeah. I think approval uh, to on the uh, in April, I think no, sorry, it was in June, um, twenty twenty one. Um, on the shelves late March 20, uh, 2022. So it was pretty quick. And obviously, though, I'm a professional, you know, I'm a writer, I have a master's in creative writing, all these yeah. things. And and w- w- the hardest part about writing the book, honestly, was working out what to leave in and what to take out because each chapter could have been its own book. You know, it's very hard to write, very hard to, to write concisely. Like everyone can sit down and, you know, bang away and have, yeah. you know, a 5,000 words of dribble, um, but when you've got like 2,000 words to talk about property management, for example, that yep. is tricky. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, that, so that is the genesis of it and uh, both of us. Um, and it was weird, actually, that, you know, there wasn't really a book out there already mm. in that. And also very disconcerting that when uh, we came up with the title, I went to look at URLs and the femaleinvestor.com.au was available still in 2021. Okay. And I'm like going. I think that's probably 99% of the battles when you've got, when you've got a creative idea. It's the actual <laughs> URL. It changes the entire creative process. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, look, the stats don't lie, unfortunately. Um, you know, the financial outcomes for women throughout their lives continue to be inferior to men. We have significantly lower super balances. Yeah. Um, you know, if you separate or divorce, the financial outcomes for women later in life are far inferior. Mm. Um, all of these things. And that's for a bunch of reasons, you know, um, which we, we don't have time to go into now. But if you read the book, you'll you'll learn about it a bit yeah, more. So gonna, um, get our hands on, on that. Yeah, book. but um, I think it's... Both of us, Kate and I, both want to um, inspire the, a younger. Well, obviously, the book is for every for a woman of any age, right? So there's yeah. that. No matter where you are in the life cycle, whether you're single, you're married, you're divorced, whatever, widowed, there is information in there for you. Um, however, what we would really like would be to inspire uh, younger women uh, in their twenties, in their thirties, before they have partnered. Um, to forge their own financial path, and that could be, and and you know, our suggestion in a low risk way is to purchase, even if it's just one property, yeah. like one well, property well, that well, they well, retain, well. that they retain independently of any yeah. whatever happens in the future. You know, um, because that even one property can really make a big difference to their yeah. financial outcome. Um, at the you know in leading up into retirement, um, but also it, it gives them an opportunity. Say for example, they do partner up and they separate, which let's be honest, forty to fifty percent of people still do. Yeah. It gives them the you know somewhere even to go, um, or it's a bit of financial independence. So we're not ending up in family court for years on end because the only thing that you have is things that you have together. Yeah, well said. Well said. And the female mindset as well, had, from your research, did that change from a male mindset when it came to investing? Do females need more, I'm going to say a little bit more guidance because they maybe haven't had the example or role model or they don't know who to trust? Does that come into play as well from part of your research? I think there has been a, you know, a big difference uh, between the genders in our um, lives mm-hmm. when it comes to financial um, understanding and yep. even just, you know, women, I guess, in, in generations gone by. It's probably not for me. I'm in a generation X and so is Kate. You know, I, I you know, was treated equally in my family. Um, you know, I had that uh, um, benefit of learning at the kitchen table, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But prior to that, you know, there is a difference, I think, in the genders in regards to, you know, talking about the stuff or even, you know, showing interest in it. And the big difference these days you know, uh, compared to 10 years ago. So when Property Investing for Dummies, you know, the second edition came out, is that there are a huge cohort of qualified professionals like yourself who can help people um, Mm -hmm. that are available out there that probably there wasn't in times gone by. And that's why we are seeing such an uptick in people who are prepared to, you know, um, work with bona fide experts such as yourself um, and, you know, whether they work with buyers, agents and things like that to actually, you know, pay for independent advice, tailored advice for them, that is going to make all the difference. And 
I think we are going to see an, a, you know, a, a continuing rise in the number of female investors because they have access to these people who weren't really there before. Like I think about, you know, when I started the REIQ 2006, there was maybe a handful of buyers agents, you know. Yeah. Um, now clearly it's it's different. So in the last, you know, 16, 17 years, that has changed uh for the better. And that will be, you know, better for women who can tap into that resource. Um, but I, I always say to anybody, look, you know, like I said before, if you're looking to work with somebody and you're going you're gonna be investing, you know, eight hundred thousand or whatever it is, depending on where you're buying. Make sure that the person is qualified, licensed, knows what they're talking about, has runs on the board, all of these things, um, because it's too it's too risky to, to to hand your money over to someone who 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 doesn't actually know what they're doing. Yeah, well said, well said. Imagine spending eight hundred thousand dollars on a car unseen, for example. You do your research on it. I'm like, that's what I tell a lot of our investors. I'm like, now you know every inch of detail and specs on a car, but you're happy to buy a property that you've never seen and have very little unseen in the neighborhood or the metrics and um, you're happy to drop you know, over half a million dollars. Let's just have a think about this as well, but I'm glad we're on the same page. So uh, I want to say thank you very much because you're taking time out on a very, very important and busy day. So I want to wish you every success with your book. Uh, touch wood, it goes well. You know, anytime you've got a great publication, it hits the spot. Um, you know, you've, you know, you've, that, that's a labor of love that you've, that you can be proud of as well. So I want to say congrats on all your books, but particularly the one that's dropping today. And uh, if you are interested in a copy or you want to find out more, please reach out to our team here at Tillia Wealth and we'll try to get our hands on a copy for you as well. But Nicola, I want to say thank you very much. We'll include links to your um, to your books, also to Pippa as well, which I think is super, super important to raise awareness around what Pippa is, what you stand for, and also who it, um, who it represents. And I'm sure we'll be chatting at some point in the future, talking about possibly your next book as well. I'm very interested to see what the next publication is. I don't want to rain on your party just yet, but um, you're probably on, with, on to the next thing, I'm sure. Is, uh, oh, I've, I've, I've given myself a commitment that I'm not writing any more books this year. But then I was <laughs> this the other day I caught myself going, well. We're one month into this year. Uh, I'm sure that'll, <laughs> that'll change as time goes on. But I want to say thank you so much for your time and your energy as well. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Aaron. It's been extraordinary to be here and th thanks for the opportunity. Ah, fantastic. If you found this episode helpful, please leave us a review, but even better, if you have questions that you maybe have for Nicole or myself, please uh, reach out to us as well. We'd love to help you. That's a wrap for another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron. Until next time, take care.